Finance professionals are the foundation of every company. They need to be in touch with current issues and be experts in adapting their organizations to future challenges. It's not about crunching the numbers. It's about seeing the road ahead. The Certified Management Accountant, or CMA, is a globally respected certification that proves your mastery of the 12 core practice areas in management accounting. Earn it and take your place at the leadership table at the world's best companies. Foresee trends through the use of technology and analytics. Be responsible and sustainable through professional ethics and standards. Add value to your career and become a financial leader of the future. I'm biased, but I really like that video. Me too. <laughs> I want to be a part of it. Very good. You may, and I'll tell you how. Let's start. <laughs> Hello, and thank you for joining. Welcome to the IMA Austria chapter event. My name is Bernardin General Lau, and I'm Director of Regional Partner Relations for IMA, the Institute of Management Accountants in Europe, based out of Zurich. I too, as you can tell, am very excited to be a part of today's kickoff event. Before we progress, I would like to inform you that this event is being recorded and by participating, you are giving your consent to the recording. Please follow basic rules of internet etiquette during the entire event and non-compliance with internet etiquette will result in a removal from the event. If you happen to experience technical difficulty, please try logging on again using the event link in a Zoom confirmation email. In case we experience any technical difficulties, please be patient and stay online for up to 10 minutes until the issue is resolved. Of course, we would communicate further steps in the unlikely event of technical problems. Just a brief introduction about IMA. We are one of the largest and most respected associations focused exclusively on advancing the management accounting profession. We're proud to support our members and the profession through research, the CMA, Certified Management Accountant Program, continuing education, networking, and advocacy of the highest ethical business practices. Our members are located all over the world and are supported regionally out of offices that you see on this map. And together with the Europe team, we work with corporations, universities, uh, students, partner associations, course providers, members and chapter leaders and other stakeholders all across the region. We support our members with a plethora of continuous learning opportunities and valuable educational resources. We believe that committing to being a learning individual or, or a learning um, organization and education is part of our social responsibility. We have some brand new resources for finance and accounting professionals launched this year. The new IMA Data Analytics and Visualization Fundamental Certificate provides uh, foundational knowledge and tools which are critical to finance professionals and will better equip them in an environment where technology continues to disrupt and transform entire industries. Now, if that sounds too basic, then you should go for the new course beyond the basics, data analytics and visualization for accounting professionals. And this offers a leading edge data analytics training to upskill today's accounting leaders. Um, Blockchain 101 is another new course. That one is unique because it is based on a gamified learning experience. You can also check out IMA Excel 365 with uh, 10 minute nano courses provided by renowned author and Excel expert, Bill Jelen, who's also called Mr. Excel, or our Calm In podcast for the latest perspectives and insights on management accounting, as told by industry experts in only 10 to 20 minutes. Um, one of our panelists today actually had a podcast before, maybe he can tell you a little bit about it later. Look into our brand new RPA series. This package of four RPA courses explores the basic terminology and functionality of RPA what risks to be made aware of and how to mitigate them, the financial and non-financial benefits of automation and the role that you can take in implementing RPA at your organization. And each course focuses on one element of RPA to provide a step-by-step -step and a holistic perspective on what it takes to bring RPA to an organization. And on top of all that, IMA offers some helpful resources to help CMA candidates prepare to take the exam free of charge and simply go to www.imanet.org to view our course catalog to get started. 
Now, if you're not yet a member of IMA, then we highly encourage you to join. And you're in luck. In the spirit of Black Friday or Black Week, we have a discount available valid until next Monday, November 30th, which I think is also called Cyber Monday. So simply register using the promo code on the screen, SAVE50, S-A-V-E-5-0, no space, to take advantage of the discount exclusive for this week. Uh, obviously, don't sign up right now because it's about to get a whole lot more interesting, but hopefully we've convinced you by the time we wrap up the event. Now I have the pleasure of introducing your hosts, the IMA Austria chapter. Now, as a chapter, its mission is to help new members pass the CMA certification, organize professional education events like this one today, and connect through networking opportunities where you get to meet people who are really passionate about accounting and, and finance. Uh, I've been told by chapter leaders that volunteering gives you valuable leadership experience while having a positive impact on others. So who wouldn't like that? If you'd like to learn more about how you can get involved and also want to get to know the board members, feel free to visit the chapter website. It's austria.imanet.org. Now, as you can see there, this picture is actually of some of the members of the Austria chapter board. Uh, from left to right, you have uh, Dominic Milner, Ivo Sokolov, and Alejandro Verdin. And if I recall, this was taken after the first lockdown in Austria. So there had to be social distancing, hence why a drone took the picture. And with that, I would like to virtually hand it over to the president of the IMA Austria chapter, Ivo Sokolov. Enjoy the rest of the event and see you hopefully soon. Ivo? The floor is yours. Hello, everyone from my side. Uh, really excited to, to, to kick off our first event for us. I'm a Austria chapter. We picked a great year to start, but uh, I think uh, uh, going forward, we'll, we'll be hosting some, some great events live as soon as uh, things normalize. And we'll be really happy to reach out to the community in Austria of CMAs, but also people interested in, 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 in you know, getting the certification uh, um, you know, uh, and, and being part of the community. We would, uh, for in the interest of time, uh, start with uh, with the with the presentation by Deloitte by Shanos Mueller uh, today, and then after her presentation, we'll allocate 10-15 minutes uh, uh, in today's call where we would uh, uh, present ourselves and talk a little bit more about the Austrian chapter. So, uh, having said that intro, and thanks a lot to to Bernardine, I will hand it over to Shan. Yeah, thank you very much, Ivo, for the nice introduction. Um, I would appreciate if Marta can now start the presentation. Thank you. Has it worked? Yes. yes. Thank you. So my name is Shana Müller. I'm the head of regulatory technology in the beautiful city of Vienna, Austria, even though we're now in a partial lockdown. And I have been advising financial institutions mainly on the prevention of money laundering, financial sanctions, and also compliance topics such as whistleblowing. And it's, it's my great pleasure to give today a short presentation on this topic that has been a companion of mine since almost 12 years, since when I started at Deloitte in 2008. And it's a great pleasure to see almost um, yeah, 50 people attending this um, course and listening to my observations over the years. I named the presentation Challenge, Chance or Hurdle. And this is mostly what I see comes to people's mind when discussing the topic whistleblowing. Therefore, in the next 25 minutes, I would like to provide a short historical overview of the development of whistleblowing, then provide the key aspects of the new EU directive, and then afterwards go to key aspects, what I think is relevant for whistleblowing management. And hopefully you will take away some new aspects and be able to, take, to answer the question for yourselves. I think it's also important to say that after my presentation, I will be available for questions. Also in case afterwards, um, you will find my contact details on the presentation, which I have been told will be provided to you. So in case you're looking for further discussion, I'm happy to have them. 
in my opinion, and I have long studied whistleblowing, it's always important to look also into the past when a topic like this comes along. And you can take some historical aspects and key learnings from it when you look into a topic. And for me, the same goes for whistleblowing. So whistleblowing is a topic looking towards the United States first because they have been sort of starting the journey. It dates back to 1863. In 1863, the False Claims Act, also known as Lincoln Law, was enacted. And the Lincoln Law not only stipulated that the people shall report misconduct, they shall be protected, but moreover be rewarded. And this um, concept of speaking up and being financially rewarded is something in the United States that also strongly differentiates to how we view whistleblowing in Europe. 100 years after the Lincoln Law, as I outlined here, the US set another precedent and they enacted the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Some of you might know this, this is called the FCPA. And the FCPA forbids the bribery of public foreign officials. And the law also stipulated that if you implement a compliance management system and have effective measures, the organization might receive a reduced or lesser or even no fine. And part of this was also the implementation of an effective whistleblowing management, which was again then outlined in the federal sentencing guidelines for organizations in 1991. Now, one could think that after the following years, um, the United States had whistleblowing cases and they were able to, to apply these laws effectively. But what happened? The United States, and this is, I think, interesting in the sense also for your organization, grappled with a lot of accounting scandals. Some of you might know them, Enron, WorldCom, some few bad apples, as George W. Bush said. And these cases only came to light because the whistleblowers reported them, sometimes even to the management who was in most of the cases even involved. And no, actors, no actions were taken. So what happened? In the following years, even more laws were enacted and the whistleblower protection and the reward system increased significantly. In 2006, the US enacted the US Tax Relief and Health Care Act and in 2010, the Dodd-Frank Act. Both acts stipulate that whistleblowers will be financially rewarded when the, um, when the court issues a fine to the organization for a breach. And this reward can be up to 30%, which is quite a high sum. Now let's have a closer look at Europe, what happened here. In Europe, the topic compliance sort of came as a gift from the United States. You can see on the slide that in 1992, the Deutsche Bank was one of the first entities to implement a compliance department. And I think it's important to say that whistleblowing and compliance goes hand in hand, because as I said prior, whistleblowing management is part of an effective compliance management system. As I said in the beginning, I started working for Deloitte in 2008. And when I started working, whistleblowing was mostly viewed as some of you might know in Harry Potter, Lord Voldemort, he who shall not be named. I remember I was also the co-founder of the working group from Transparency International Austria on whistleblowing. And in the beginning, only we were only a group of seven people. So quite less of the chapter that you are here. And we refer to us as the self-help group because the only topic we kind of discuss is how do we approach the topic? What are international best practices? Because this was a topic that nobody really wanted to speak about. However, when working at Deloitte, all of the forensic or most of the forensic investigations were launched by whistleblowers who reported on fraud and corruption. Still, in many organizations, the primary question was, who blew the whistle? And it was not about the analysis of the actual report. I think it's also to say that the term whistleblower has always been associated with a tattletaler, a denunciant, or even a snitch. So mostly negative connotations. You could even see it in old newspapers from the 1970s when there were cases that were reported by whistleblowers, how they were described. 
they were seen as blowing up the whistle on an organization and not seen as a help to discover or um, know more about internal issues, prevent severe damage or uh, improve the implemented measures. In the early 2000s, as I outlined here, on the European level, there were no um, consistent whistleblowing regulations. And this meant that the whistleblowers were either protected by labor law or such as freedom of speech. I don't want to go into details of all the laws that are outlined here. And as you can see, I've sort of focused on the Austrian laws that were enacted after. But I do want to point out to a case that I think is quite excellent in showing this topic. In 2011, there was a really famous case called Brigitte Heinisch, who was a German caregiver and who reached a decision by the European Court of Human Rights. And she was a caregiver and outlined in her nursing home that there was a severe mistreatment of the elders. However, her employer did not take any measures and she had reported for numerous times internally about it. Subsequently, she went then to an external party, to a lawyer, and they fought her dismissal all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights, who ruled in her favor. And the ruling was done under Article 10, which allowed the freedom of speech. And they weighed the interest of the older people and also viewed that um, Mrs. Brigitte Heinisch had to speak up externally in order to stop this severe mistreatment. She was only awarded 150,000 euros, which is a pale sum compared to what the US system foresees. There, the highest sum that was ever given to a whistleblower was over a hundred million euros. However, I think that the case is quite interesting. And if you have a chance to read the ruling, it gives you some interesting aspects also on the new European directive because many of the components that were outlined in the ruling are also included in the directive. What I think the case also outlines is the, um, is the contradiction that goes along with whistleblowing. So what happened to, um, to other whistleblower cases? As part of working for transpar or leading the Transparency International Working Group, um, we had invited Michael Woodford, who was the former CEO of Olympus. And um, he um, discovered massive accounting fraud in Japan. And he had written seven internal reports on this to various departments, internal audit, the external auditor, in order to say this, listen people, we need to stop this, this needs to stop, we had, need to analyze this and have a look at it. However, no actions were taken. And this is what can be seen for most whistleblower cases. They first report internally, and then if no steps are taken, go externally. And this is the same with Michael Woodford. He eventually went to external authorities and also the media. And this is also what whistleblowers have faced over the years, retaliation. And also in the US, a study was conducted that most of the whistleblowers were even suicidal. I think fast forward then to 2018, I think from the development in European Union or international, you can see there were a lot of whistleblower cases, a lot of investigations that were launched by it, a lot of leakages, the Bahamas leaks, the Panama Papers, and all of these um, yeah, threats to the public caused or ruled for or resulted in the EU directive, which was enacted in 2019 and has to be transposed into national law by 2021. So when looking to the past, there are some key takeaways that should be important. And also for the following slides, whistleblowing is not denunciation. We define whistleblowing as the report of misconduct to an internal or external authority. The EU directive also foresees that the whistleblower reports it with reasonable grounds. So he doesn't merely uh, just think something has happened. He has to some um, extent um, information that validates it. In most of the organizations, a study conducted by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, 43.3% 40 of the fraud is discovered by whistleblowers. And most of these reports and 50% of the cases are reported internally. 
So as you can see, in most cases, the whistleblowers first go internally before they disclose the information externally. And when information is disclosed internally within the organization, there is the opportunity to address this, to analyze this, and to set measures. A reward system is something, or a financial report system, is something that is only known in the Anglo-American legal system. And whistleblowing is a part of the compliance management system. Many, uh, also European legislation, outline this. And due to the fact that this was mostly regulated in the European Union, we now have the European Directive, to which I want to highlight some points. The European Directive was already enacted last year in October, so almost one year and a month ago. I think that 2021 will be, whistleblowing will be the, the talk of the town in compliance departments and within the organization. And the European Union only provides a minimum standard. It is a directive and therefore has to be transposed by the respective member states. Most of the provisions have to be implemented or transposed within two years, so December 17, 2021. The EU only outlines a common minimum standards, so it's up to the member states to implement stricter rules. But I do want to say that from our experience, and we have seen the opinion that Austria has given to the EU directive, we are not sure whether stricter rules will be implemented. And it's also still up to discussion. We have been um, talking with uh, legal representatives of the execution and the legislation here in Austria, how it will be implemented. As it is a directive, each member state might take a different approach. I think it's also important that the EU directive is a regulation on the protection of persons who report breaches of the union law. So what does this mean? The scope of the application is for a reporting person which we would define as a whistleblower. This is the person who works in the private or public sector and who acquires information in a work-related context. The EU directive is very broad in terms of who is covered from this directive and who is protected. Because it covers not only the workers, but also, for example, volunteers, paid and unpaid trainees and third persons who are also connected to the reporting person. So this could be a supplier or somebody else. And I think this also goes to show what the real purpose is. The real purpose of the directive, and this is what they outline in the previous introduction, is the protection of the people who report breaches of union law. This is now something that I find to be quite interesting because in the past, most of the high profile cases within organizations also covered topics such as fraud, corruption. However, the EU, EU directive stipulates that the reporting is on breaches falling within the context of union law. So as you can see, the topics that are outlined are mostly broad and cover topics that threaten the harm of the people or interests of the European Union. As I said prior, the member states can implement stricter rules if, if they wish to do so. So it could be that member states also foresee that there will be other um, topics that um, have to be, um, where the whistleblowers have to be protected. I find these topics are quite interesting. So as you can see, data protection, transport safety, consumer protection, these are all topics that are very broad and not specifically to a, a certain organization or to a certain branch. These are more topics that are more general and can have an effect on our whole society. And who is now obliged to establish internal reporting channels? It's legal entities in the private sector with 50 people or more, and also legal entities in the public sectors or who are controlled by such, municipalities with more than 10,000 inhabitants. As I said, again, it is noteworthy that each member state can apply stricter rules. I think also what it means is um, that I think what has, is important that you have to give as giveaway from this EU directive that I want to outline on the next page. So you kind of see what kind of process the EU directive foresees. I think even though the directive does not address all of the issues that we have seen from the historical aspect, it is still a massive step towards the right direction. 
because for the first time we have a process that defines whistleblowing. To, an, to give it to you in a nutshell, because I like to receive my information mostly with visually. A whistleblower, so a reporting person, acquires information on breaches. And the breaches falls within the European. They report the breaches internally or externally. So it can be to a legal entity from the public private sector or to a competent authority. They have to acknowledge the receipt of the report within seven days. This is actually kind of a big step forward because sometimes it took the organization quite a long time. And this puts the pressure also on the organization to have an effective process to be able to answer to this report immediately. And also they have to provide feedback on the diligent follow-up that they conducted. So it is a requirement to investigate or to analyze the report there as such. And the whistleblower shall receive the respective protection, not only to the whistleblower, but also to other persons who could face potential retaliation. So it has to be also part of the thorough analysis of the institution who receives the report that they will look who could be possibly effective. If no appropriate measures or no follow-up is provided, the whistleblower is allowed to disclose the report publicly. The EU directive foresees that this case can be where no appropriate action was taken. The breach, breach constitutes an imminent or manifest danger to the whistleblower themselves, or there is a huge risk of retaliation, low prospect of breach being addressed. I think looking back to the case of Brigitte Heinisch, the caregiver from the nursing home, she actually did report the breach internally and no appropriate action was taken. And therefore the European Court of Rules um, ruled in her favor. So basically the summary that I in initially gave to you is actually uh, implemented in the EU directive. So what does the EU, EU directive can provide us already, even though it might still be one year until we will see the implementation of first drafts from the member states on the implementation. It can provide us with a process and on how to set up the whistleblowing. It provides information on what kind of requirements are on the selection of the tool, kind of what whistleblowing system. Should it be a letterbox, a telephone hotline? Does it really adhere to confidentiality? Does it allow the whistleblower to report, to stay anonymous? Does it allow the institution to give a response. I think these are all aspects that can already uh, support each organization who does not yet have a whistleblowing system to implement such. And this is where the effective whistleblowing comes into space or comes into, into focus. And I think the whistleblowing management is often viewed as um, a little bit as, yeah, let's implement a tool. It's another IT tool we need. But I don't think that's really the case because from my experience, three different topics are covered. It's, it has technological aspects, procedural and legal. And all of these um, stakeholders that you have to involve are essential in order for the system to be effective. And the whistleblowing management covers the, implement, the um, implementation of the system, the report of a misconduct, the analysis and the closing of the case. Let's have a closer look at each one of them. And in the midst, I would give some observations of what I have experienced in the past from uh, working on the many different projects covering these topics. Let's first go to the aspect of technology. If the organization does not yet have a whistleblowing system, or even if they do, it is important to select, design, establish, and implement an adequate whistleblowing system. And here we have already come to the first kind of hurdle because it needs to be taken into observation or evaluation. How can the system be reached by the employees? Some employees might not have access to internet. It's easier to dial a free telephone number that they are given to where they can potentially report a misconduct. 
For some employees, it might be better if it's a web-based platform because it's available 24 seven. It also needs to be taken into consideration what kind of language the system has to be. Maybe it only needs to be in German, but also maybe English. We had clients where the compliance guideline was written in English. However, most of the employees did not understand it and therefore they never reported anything. So the effectiveness comes down to whether you have a very good understanding of your organization and the requirements it needs. Also, it might be, uh, it might be recommended to implement a multi-channel system. It should also be clearly defined who has access and control to the respective whistleblowing system. And the people who are um, managing the system also need to be trained on the respective whistleblowing solution. The definition of access and controls, I think is crucial also in terms of um, the reported misconduct, because this might be very sensitive information that comes through these hotlines and it should not be something that will be discussed in the coffee kitchen. The second aspect that I think is very crucial, and this is also whether a system is really effective, are procedural aspects. First of all, drafting a whistleblowing guideline where you outline what kind of conduct can be reported. As I said prior, the European Union mainly covers topics that are um, concerned for the um, aspects or the harm of the entire society. So data protection, transport safety, consumer protection, and the prevention of money laundering and terrorist financing. However, I believe that many of the organizations who have a compliance management system will view it as important that other topics will be included as well, such as fraud or corruption or conflict of interests. And the reporting process therefore has to be clearly defined. So who can report? Who shall have access to the whistleblowing system? Only internal employees or also external suppliers maybe who can provide me with some information. Who will receive the message? And also who will conduct then an objective and a certain assessment of the accuracy of the whistleblower report? And this is really important because what I've, as I outlined prior, in the previous years, I have often seen that the focus shifts on who blew the whistle. It is not focused on the actual content of the report. If you ever have worked in an organization and or a compliance department by any chance and um, or seen um, any of a whistleblower report, you will know that most of these reports are also somewhat contain, can contain emotional content or emotional language. So it's really important to decipher the message and understand what is the actual allegation that is in such a report. And the most important topic for, or the most important question for the organization who receives such a report is, can the information be validated or is it not true? And what are the damages that are actually uh, that uh, have been caused by this misconduct and also the assessment as i outlined uh, on the previous page should also include who might fear retaliation because what does the eu directive actually say the organization has to take measures to protect the whistleblowers and they have to do this not only maybe by uh, implementing a system that allows anonymity and confidentiality, they actually have to take necessary steps. And this can be done by awareness raising. So what does the management think of a whistleblowing hotline? Do they support it and endorse it? What do they view of cases like this? I think for many of the public whistleblower cases that have been where the whistleblowers have disclosed their personal identity, you know that the whistleblower always feared retaliation and experienced it to a great severe and that it was not supported by the management. On the contrary, the management often tried to suppress the information. I believe therefore it is really important that the communication process is clearly defined and the management commits themselves, but not only the management, all of the people involved in the reporting line. So the management, the um, 
the department heads, everybody has to know that their part is really important in the effective whistleblowing management. Last but not least, let's not forget, and which I think is very important, the legal aspects, labor law and data protection law. I don't want to get into a too detailed legal discussion here, but I think it's important to outline the facts. So for data protection, it's really important that the system is compliant with the general data protection regulation. It's the EU data protection regulation, which has some open clauses where you need to look into the local law. But the data protection especially um, is relevant with regard to the confidentiality of the whistleblower, their anonymity, and how the entire system is implemented who has access to the information, how the information is retained and then eventually also deleted, and how is the response to the whistleblower treated. Also, what happens when you conduct an investigation in, within the organization, it's important to think about which information can you access. Do you have a, um, an, a sort of legal basis for accessing the information? On the other hand, labor law aspects are highly relevant as well. As I said, the EU directive was implemented to protect people who report misconduct on breaches of the, EU, of the union law in case they receive this information in a work-related context. So this already outlines that it's in a work-related context. And of course, the employee is protected by the EU directive and then the um, respective member state um, laws, but also um, it is important to think about what happens in the course of an investigation, how are the employees treated, what um, is the workers council involved when, for example, implementing a whistleblowing system, how is the content reviewed in terms of do immediate steps need to be taken for a dismissal. So all of these key aspects, the technological, the procedural and the legal aspects are relevant when implementing a system. And I think it's really important to take these giveaways that also the respective stakeholders for all these departments have to be involved to implement a system successfully. If you only take one aspect away, you might foresee something and not be compliant with the EU directive with the local or then the respective local laws. As a last point, I would also outline, like to point out that we from Deloitte also provide a whistleblowing solution. It's an internet-based platform which can be adopted to the respective needs. It's called Deloitte Halo, as I outlined here, a little halo. And it allows for a web-based, for the implementation of a web-based platform at our clients. And the clients, um, you can access the whistleblowing black platform Halo online. You receive the report and then it will be forwarded by one of the Deloitte employees to you to then conduct further investigation. The Deloitte Halo system is not only compliant uh, with GDPR and the already EU whistleblowing directive, it also allows for easy flexibility to be applied to um, the specific needs of the organization. And it, I think it's important to say that the system is um, compliant with various IT standards and data security standards. Last but not least, I'd like to just summarize my main points. To sum it all up as a question for my initial remarks, is whistleblowing a challenge, a chance or a hurdle? I'd like to think the relevant uh, points are, implement a system that is tailored to your organization. Involve the relevant stakeholders such as data protection officer, workers council, internal audit compliance, and also communicate it adequately to the employees to receive endorsement. Make sure the management communicates the importance of the system and its purpose, because the purpose of a whistleblowing system is to disclose misconduct within the organization. The process of operation of the solution shall be clearly defined. Who conducts the analysis? Also, for example, if the compliance officer is involved, there has to be a clear step or a clear step of processes to minimize also conflict of interest. And lastly, but not 
Lastly, it's important to understand that each whistleblower report is also an, an important opportunity for the organization to improve its controls, governance, and overall processes. And I think this is something that uh, therefore is a well important topic also in the next coming years. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sean. I uh, it was a great, great overview about the, about this this complicated and multidisciplinary topic. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, some of the in, uh, attendees for uh, yeah, questions um, on the presentation or on the topic in general. Practice the directive. Anything you would like to ask, Sean? Don't be shy. Oh, there's a question. I see. Do you expect the Austrian implementation to limit the reasons for whistleblowing? Um, uh, I don't think so. I think that um, in, I mean, the as I said prior, that the regulation only covers various topics that are relevant to the union law. But from our experience, we see that many um, of the institutions have already broader compliance um, guidelines that cover much more topics. So I assume that each organization will also um, um, yeah, cover more topics. I don't think it will be a limit. I think this will be really a push forward and we see it in the requests from clients. So um, from my experience in the past years, there was always various peaks in legislation and compliance topic. And since the EU directive, the focus is entirely like going away from, let's say, for example, GDPR to whistleblowing. So that's my opinion to the Austrian implementation. I don't think it will limit the reason. I think we will see much more, um, yeah, much more, much more whistleblowing <laughs> because of this. And I think it's important that it mostly is um, this is relevant for especially the private and public sector as the financial institutions already have the obligation to implement such a system. Um, the next question is how is the Austrian situation different from the other countries in the EU? Um, so far, um, I mean, for the, um, I think that in also many other European Union countries, um, though I have not looked into this in detail, I think there is no nor um, let's say one legislation on whistleblowing. And this is, I think, what the European or what the Euro directive will now change. I think this is, um, yeah, quite different or quite similar. Um, so looking, for example, towards, um, let's say Germany, I also know that they don't have a whistleblower protection law. I think it mainly derives from labor law and other, um, other topics. Um, the, the other question was whether, have you worked with companies that use anonymous 1-800 numbers administered by third parties? No, actually we have not. I don't think I have seen in the past um, any company that has implemented a telephone hotline, though according to the US, this is the system that most whistleblower use, which always surprises us because um, we, the whistleblower cases we analyze are received by email, by a web-based platform. And my, the question is now whether we support this approach. I think it has to be looked into specific, whether it's really compliant with the EU directive. Does it offer that the whistleblower can remain its anonymity? Does it offer the whistleblower to, um, how will they get, get a response? I think this is really important because the EU does see pr to provide feedback. The whistleblower then would have to leave their, their phone number. Can anonymity be really then 
uh, granted. I think this has to be looked at specifically. If this is interesting for you, we can maybe discuss this after. Um, I think the corporate culture within, I, I was asked whether the corporate culture has changed in the past five to 10 years. I think, yes, I think we have seen a growth in terms of awareness, in terms of also liability of, um, of yeah, <laughs> of the stakeholders. I mean, there, there are many cases now. It's um, where I think, I mean, I think in the 1990s, I like to say it was still allowed to deduct um, bribes from your taxes. This is now seen as not being allowed anymore. And these, I think, are the changes we have seen over the past few years. And as I said, in 2008, whistleblowing was still kind of like um, um, nobody talked about it. And now it's kind of the buzzword. So yes, I do believe we have seen some changes in the corporate culture um, and also in the investigative process and the legislative process. So just as a last example, in Germany, there's currently a law enacted which um, really will increase the liability of organizations to a severe point. So um, yes, I think the awareness and the corporate culture has changed. Um, with regard to Switzerland, I'm not aware. However, I do know that um, we have spoken, um, we had invited a speaker from, from Switzerland who operated um, a whistleblowing system already in 2010. And um, she was also um, very much um, implementing this system. I would not know in detail about Switzerland, though I can provide this information afterwards. I do, I do think from recent news or what I um, observe is that um, also the, the authorities are have implemented systems where report where misconduct can be reported. Um, the financial reward, yeah, I think it's it's um, it. I have not still decided what I really think about it. I think um, it's difficult to say. I think uh, I understand why the US has implemented this um, sort of like a financial reward system. And I think they hope to receive more messages though. I think that when you disclose something it should be um, just from your own moral standards. And I'm not sure this should be, there should be a financial reward for this though I have not really concluded whether I think um, this is the right way to go. Um, making it a broader topic, of course, I think if there's a financial incentive, then people will report more. But is this the right approach? I think our, in Europe, our history is also severely different to the United States. And for us, um, whistleblowing has kind of a historical negative connotation. I think this is what we need to overcome here. And I'm not sure if this can be done by simply a reward system. Yes, the Austrian uh, government offices um, operate whistleblower hotlines. There are various authorities such as the Financial Market Authority, the Authority for Cartel, um, and also the Public Prosecutor's Office. They all have implemented um, long ago since 2013 whistleblower system. This is also actually, by the way, something that they have seen, that they have looked to in Germany where this was um, a huge thing and kind of set precedents for other countries. Um, the impact on the existing whistleblowing side, which is run by Austrian Staatsanwaltschaft, I think, um, I mean, what I kind of expect is because this topic is so buzzed about and we see so many articles and workshops, presentations, trainings, I think that the, that the number of reports will increase. And I think this is also, um, yeah, I think the number of reports will increase. And I think that if this topic is then implemented into a law, I think that people also within organizations in the first few years, I think there will be severe peaks and then it will kind of like normalize again. I'm not sure if offering a bonus for encouraging whistleblower will be against the law, though I think you would have to look at um, the probably local labor or national labor law. I'm not um, a labor law expert. I'm not sure how this relates. Um, 
if this is interesting, I can I can forward this question to our labor law expert who covers this topic, but I have not seen this question so far because for most of the organizations, a uh, reward system is completely uh, is not um, is not completely off topic. What guidance? So the 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 question was whether what guidance may be published to reduce the fake claims. I think it's um, all about the communication and a whistleblowing guideline and how this topic is viewed within the organization. What is the corporate culture? Because sometimes I think um, a whistleblower will report something internally and then it's easy to say, oh yeah, you know, just another story or whatever. But I think um, it's important to pick it up and to look at it really from a neutral point of view. I think key for to minimize fake claims is to, to say, what is the purpose of the hotline and to address this also with the right people. And as I said, I think the involvement of the management is crucial. It's always toned from the top in all the organizations that we have seen or that were, um, you know, where there were highly um, publicized disclosures, you, you can have a look at how the organization is working and how the corporate culture is. And I think this reveals a lot also then if there might be fake claims. I think it's important to really set this out in a very, um, yeah, kind of um, tone. Are there numbers on this? <clears throat> no, I don't think so. Um, the question was, are there numbers on the success of the whistleblowing legislation in EU or US? How many cases and what outcome? I have not seen such an overview. I know, for example, that the US publishes um, in, as part of the US.Frank Act each year a kind of report on how many um, investigations or rulings were initiated by whistleblowers and how many rewards they were given. I think the, from the EU directive, then once it's implemented, they will expect the member states to collect this information and it will be then uh, kind of like as a companion on the EU level and maybe to also see the effectiveness of the EU directive. But so far I have ne not seen um, such, a, such a report on the number of successes. Sean, hello. Um, I'm Alejandro, I'm the chapter secretary. Hi. Hi. Um, I just sent a question over the chat, but apparently it didn't reach you. So I'm just going to read it again. Yes. Um, is, there, is there a minimum threshold on the size of the company, their revenue or full-time no. employees at a EU level to implement the whistle, whistleblower system? There is no, um, so the threshold is not related to the revenue. This was initially in the first draft of the guideline. However, it's not included anymore. It was let, um, it was, um, yeah, deleted then from the from the published version. So it uh, it only relates to how many people are working at the respective company, and there it is the threshold of 50 people or more in the private sector. As I said. Um, the member states are allowed to implement more rules, but I doubt that they will then come up with a threshold regarding revenue because it was not included in the final version. I would think so. Okay, um, thanks. Is, 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 is this already uh, forced and forced on all companies about 50 employees or is still alternate on, um, on, on a... Um, if they want to do, if they want to implement it on an optional basis. Oh, no, it's not. It's it's an obligation then. It's an Once, obligation. Already. Yes, yes. Thanks, so thank you very it, much. Yeah, sure. E excellent presentation, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So the last question was, uh, what about whistleblowing within the EU commissariat and EU organization? It's not a prime example. I must say, I have not looked into this, so um, I can provide the answers um, later on the open topics. Um, I, I think that, I mean, for me, the EU commissary and EU organization, though I have not viewed this, they would be viewed as competent authorities. So um, I think that if you work there, it's probably that they have an internal reporting channel and from an external point of view. So for example, if I would say, if I would work within a different organization, 
and they would not take appropriate measures and um, the EU come, I, I'm not sure, <laughs> my, my argumentation hinks. I, I have not thought this really through, honestly, to be frank. Mr. Mueller, I would like to provide a, a, an answer later on if that's possible. Yeah, maybe uh, at this point, um, I yes, because we have five minutes, we have to be cognizant sorry. of the time. Um, I, I think it was a brilliant presentation, Sean. Thank you so much for sharing, you know, uh, your insights and uh, very well laid out. And also, thanks, uh, thanks a lot to our attendees for the yes, lively conversation Q and A. Uh, it is, a, it is, a, yeah, yeah it's great stuff. It, even a few questions went unanswered, uh, unanswered about industries, mm -hmm. about other things, but just in the interest of, of, of time, I would like to say, uh, take two minutes of your time mm -hmm. to introduce the chapter board and talk about what we plan to do as activities. Um, well, um, for starters, um, this is our kickoff event. Uh, we, we, we will be organizing, you know, uh, starting early next year uh, and, and well into, uh, into, um, into, into the year, more events like this. Uh, inviting brilliant speakers and uh, and people from the industry to talk about relevant topics to management accountants and finance professionals. Uh, we would, uh, uh, there's already the next event lined up for January. As far as this event is concerned, I will, um, uh, you know, as was answered, uh, one CP of ethics uh, credit will be awarded to the attendees. Um, so that, that must be said. I, um, yeah, let, let me introduce for, for real quick, just introduce the rest of the chapter uh, chapter for colleagues. Uh, I, I would like to start with uh, Alejandro, who is our secretary, um, uh, and, uh, and, and also Christine, uh, our membership VP, uh, and also Dominic. I think we, we have everyone on the call. So maybe if you just can jump in for, for like one minute to say a word, uh, that would be great. Okay, hello. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Alejandro. Um, I I closed. I achieved my CMA degree in 2016, and since then I can say that my career has 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 taken a good launch on on growing forward. Um, I I am happy to be part of the of the chapter, which which is something that I was already hoping for to have a local representation that we are. Also, that the CMA is promoted within Austria, and I'm sure that we all together with the leadership of, of Evo, we will do a great job. Thank you. Maybe Christina, if you could, if you could uh, say a few words. you're on mute or if not uh i don't think we've included Do dominic in the panel yes okay the hi, hi, hi yeah. dominic. I, I will jump in for christine hi hi everyone um uh, yeah first of all thank you very much Shan. it was a brilliant uh, presentation um i think a very good uh, kickoff for our austrian chapter excellent work um yeah i i'm part of the i'm in europe since 2015 i have completed my examination in this year i was one of i think the first in austria uh, it was, I think, at the very first stage also of my financial career, and I think I think it was a very good investment in terms of uh, knowledge and in terms of money. I have to say, uh, it's really an excellent network, and I'm really glad to be now part of the Austrian chapter board. I think we have uh, plenty of ideas um, how to yeah, deliver content and, and knowledge to our. Uh, members, uh, of course, we invite everyone to contribute to support us in this uh, plan. Uh, at the moment, we are four of us in the board, but I think we, we all look forward to your input as well to make this Austin chapter a success uh, and maybe also uh, to develop uh, all our skills in, in managing um, accounting topics in our corporate world. And yeah, thank you very much for this first kickoff and good luck for everyone. Yeah, thanks, Dominic. Just one last word. Uh, uh, so Christina just mentioned she's having problem with her setup microphone. So um, yeah, so she will maybe introduce herself one of the next events. Please to all of uh, our Austrian uh, members and Austrian colleagues and non-members in Austria, do reach out uh, if you want to know more. Um, we we are available. Uh, also, if you want to volunteer and and participate in organizing these events and and chapter activities, um, it'd be super encouraged and and super great to work with you. 
uh, we, um, we will share uh, more information on our chapter website uh, as we move along. And I think at this point, we're right on time to conclude this session. Uh, and I'm just going to hand it over to, uh, to uh, Bernadine. Thanks, everyone. That concludes this event. So just to wrap up, thank you for joining this kickoff event. Um, all the attendees will be uh, receiving a post-event email with a redacted presentation as well as Sean's contact details. So feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Other than that, stay tuned. Follow us on all our channels to be uh, informed of uh, recent developments in terms of the chapter activities. I look forward to meeting you all soon again when this is all over. And uh, stay safe, stay sane, stay healthy. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice evening. You too, Shan.